Hey, Bass HBF for 64K, and welcome to my first product review. So today we're going to have a look at the C64 Mini. It's something I've been anticipating greatly. I'm a massive Commodore 64 fan, obviously. So in this video, I'm not only going to show the system, but I'm also going to go through the most common questions that get asked about it. I'm going to answer all of those, because I've had a week to experience the system right now. So I've got the gist of it. We're also going to play and show every single game on the system, all 64 of them. So without further ado, let's cue that intro. Hey you, kid with a crappy wheelchair! Welcome to 64K. Hosted by Bass Tish B. And welcome back. So let me just show you the box. So this is the Commodore 64 Mini. If you don't know, it's a small miniaturized consoleized version of a Commodore 64 computer that came out in 1982. It comes with 64 games. He has some of the highlighted stuff and he has a full listing of every single game on the system. It tells you what comes in the box. I'm going to show you everything that's inside you, so we'll get to that shortly. I thought I'd start this video by going through five of the most commonly asked questions about the system. The first question you probably want answered if you're living outside of the UK is, is this system import friendly? The simple answer is yes. The biggest issue with importing stuff from around the world is obviously power issues. What is this running on? Am I going to need a converter? Etc. Etc. The first thing to know is that it's powered by USB, so you have no issue there. You can plug it into your computer or anything that has a USB slot and uh, you're way to go. Am I going to have to get some sort of video converter? The PAL format is European, NTSC is North America, so is this thing going to work if I bring it over here? The answer again is yes. It's got a lot of built-in options in the menus, which I'll show later, but if you plug it into any modern TV or any monitor, it has HDMI, and it's, from my opinion, it worked perfectly. I never had to do anything, and I'm living here in Canada. We're on NTSC. No problems whatsoever. Same with the power. No problem. I plugged it into my computer. I'm using that as a power source. Okay, so question number two. What about games that have a lot of keyboard functions? You know use F1 or F2 to change weapons like in The Last Ninja. So how does that work? Well, the controller that it comes with has eight buttons on it. So all these games have been customized, so almost everything is functioning on the actual controller itself. The system also has a keyboard overlay. You can press one button on the controller and it brings it up to the side. So if there's anything slightly weird that has to be inputted, you can do it that way. That's not the best method, as you probably all know like from trying out anything. You can plug in a USB keyboard into the C64 Mini though, and that'll give you a full keyboard yourself to type away and do whatever. It's definitely an awesome solution. And question number three, can you put your own games onto this thing? The answer is yes. So the reason why I say that is you can put your own games. It's a little bit limited right now. They are working on a firmware to update this to give you the kind of the full gamut. You'll be able to put anything you want on there. As of right now, you can put kind of smaller single load games, games that don't require multiple discs or disc swapping. Yeah, I'm going to make a separate follow-up video to this that'll just be totally dedicated to how to put games onto the system. And question number four, is this thing going to be supported after it's released? Well, it came out at the end of March. We now are into, I'm um, busy shooting this right now. This is April 7th. They've already had their first firmware update, which came out on April 5th. You can go to the C64 Mini website and download that, or you can go to their Facebook page. It's got a link. I've already done that. I'll show a quick little excerpt later on on how to do that. It's very simple. It fixes a few little bug fixes and very minor stuff. I haven't noticed any of the things that they were talking about that was wrong, but uh, I updated it anyway. And the next firmware update that they're currently working on is going to resolve all the issues that comes along with putting your own games on there. It's going to allow 
multi-load games, multi-disc games. It's going to allow you to put multiple games on USB cards, all that kind of stuff. It's everything as a hardcore gamer, definitely, that you want to see. And question number five, the final one. So, is the system friendly for newbies? The short answer is yes, again. Um, I'm a veteran, so this system is pretty cool. I, I have a really good opinion of it. I think it's great that this is out. I know there's a lot of people in the communities that are iffy about it, especially in the Commodore communities. Some people love it or hate it. It's not really an issue of that. I feel any system that comes out where they kind of promoting the thing that I love to a new generation, that can only be positive in my books. So, is this, is this mini good for a person that's never played any Commodore 64 games before and doesn't know anything about it? I would definitely say yes. The reason I say that is the variety of games on here is very arcadey centric. Very arcadey action kind of stuff. So that's just much easier games to get into for a person that's getting new to a system. There's a lot of genres missing. I'm not gonna BS you. RPGs, tactical war games, flight simulators, all these kinds of things, a lot of those are kind of missing. But as far as like just an overall arcade experience, then this is a pretty good selection. It's definitely a great entry level to uh, discovering a whole bunch of really cool classics that you probably maybe have never heard of or even seen before. If you live in Europe or Australia or something like that, then you guys definitely know all these games like I do. But uh, North American people over here, they don't even know the slightest clue about 90% of these games. So I think for you guys, this is gonna be a really cool experience. <laughs> Okay, so he has the box, the world's best selling home console, I like the fact that they have 64 games, it's a nice little reference to the system, he has the quick guide, it's a little instruction manual, gives you the basics of the controller functions and also the basics of the little mini console. What I like about this quick guide is that it's done in the same way as the Commodore 64 user's guide, the original version, I made it look like it, pretty cool. Here is the controller, very nice, it's done like total retro style, it's got 8 buttons, it's not micro switched unfortunately, that's the only complaint I can say about it, buttons feel good, these are the main buttons you use a lot, this one takes you back to the main menu for any game, that's very nice, this is the USB connection, here is the HDMI cords, here is the power mini USB and a regular USB, and here is the console itself. Look how beautiful that is. Keyboards don't work obviously. Nice little logo and the power there. And on the side you got the two USB connections and your power on switch over there. And on the back you got the power in and the HDMI connection. So that's everything you get in the original packaging. And here is the C64 Mini next to its big brother just to give you a size comparison. And if you didn't know, they're actually making a full, almost full-size keyboard version of the Commodore 64 Mini that should be coming out later this year. So anybody that helped out with the original campaign or pre-ordered that thing got sent a C64 Mini for free. So that's, that's how I got this, which is, <laughs> it's really generous. Not only did they send me that, but I also got a whole bunch of awesome Commodore 64 posters, which I'll show you right now. Yeah, we got this one where it's uh, like, you know, Commodore and uh, dragons and robots and spaceships all fighting. Very classic 80s looking. This one's like a blueprint of the actual controller. Yeah, we got a horizontal one. It's kind of a C64 mini keyboard. And this is my favorite one of the bunch. It's so nice that I had it framed. If you want to have a look here. C64 Mini, it shows every single game that is on the system. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the basic functions that happen when you first power on this little beast. Okay, when you first power it on, you've got your good old language settings, choose whatever you need. He has the main menu stuff at the bottom here, this is the display section. They got a nice variety here. You got European 4x3, you got North American 4x3, North American 4x3 with CRT look, European 4x3 with CRT look, and the Pixel Perfect CRT. It's a nice little 
selection of looks and next we've got the system settings this is where you can update your firmware and do all that kind of stuff here is basic you can think of basic as a commodore 64 version of dos i've just put on the virtual keyboard on the side there so i haven't got a keyboard attached right now so i'm just doing a basic load function like you would load up a disc you're going to need to know these functions when you want to put your own games on here I have got a video in my how-to section on how to do all the Commodore 64 disk functions. Okay, so I've just gone back into the settings now. I'm going to do a firmware update. The first one was available a few days ago. So basically I went to the website, the c64.com, and I downloaded the update and I put it on a USB stick and I stuck that into one of the USB ports on the side. And I went into settings like you just saw and I'm updating it. It's probably the most painless update I've ever been through. <laughs> anyway, here's the look of the actual menus. They're really nice. You can see it gives you a description of the game, the composer, the genre, etc, etc. And now that we got all the basic functions out of the way, let's get to the good part of the video, you know, the one where we play all the games. Now, before I get started, I'm going to do this in rapid fire. So we're going to go through all 64 games super quick. I have to say that out of all these games on here, there's about three or four which I had never played before. So 95% of the games on here I've actually played. So pause this video, make yourself some coffee or tea. Yeah, or 64 game reviews in eight minutes. First up is Alley Cat, a classic game from programmer Andrew Braybrook. Think of this as F-Zero and the Sega Arcade Classic Zaxxon mashed together. Next up is Anarchy, a funky tank slash puzzle game from Houston. It was strange then and it still is now, but it's still a pretty decent puzzle game. Next up is Armalite, one of my favorite C64 shoot 'em ups of all time. Perfect in every way from graphics to sound. Please check out my rapid fire review of this game in that playlist. Next is Avenger, a pretty cool gauntlet type game, only with a ninja from Gremlin Graphics and features a really cool musical score by Ben Daglish. Next is Battle Valley, that was a budget game from 1988 that is way better than it should be. A scrolling tank based shoot 'em up and features music and sound effects from Jerome Tell. Next is Boulder Dash, which is a classic 1984 game about digging for diamonds and not getting yourself killed in the process. Still just as much fun as it's always been. Bounder is next one of the many weird ball bouncing games that Gremlin Graphics seemed to love in the 1980s. <laughs> this game is super tough and not for the faint hearted. Next is California Games which is one of the best games by Epix. This multi load extreme sports game has been ported to every system under the sun. This is still by far the best version. Next is Chips Challenge which is an underrated puzzle game from Epix released in 1990. This is still a really fun game to play and the puzzles are really clever. Next is Confusion which is a totally rubbish game. <laughs> It's not even worth a look for the Rob Hubbard music, which is really average at best. Next up is Cosmic Causeway, another of Gremlin's footballs and space games. Super difficult, nice graphics and sound. It's not going to be to everybody's liking. Next is Creatures, which is a pure platform gaming greatness from the Roland Brothers. A pumping soundtrack and excellent graphics, and wait until you get to those awesome torture scenes. Cyberdown Warrior is a brilliant platform action game, a game from the Roland Brothers. Boss gameplay, excellent animation and music. Next up is Cybernoid, a tough as nails shoot 'em up from Houston, where you explore caves and kill space pirates. Great graphics and another excellent score by Jerome Tell. And next is Cybernoid 2, the sequel, and it's even better than the original in my opinion. Same gameplay, slightly better graphics, and yet another excellent soundtrack. Deflect is an underrated puzzle game that is well worth your time. It's a lot of fun with great presentation and really good music. Next is Everyone is a Wally, which is a port of an old Spectrum game, which my elitist C64 attitude didn't want to give the time of day back in 1980s. It's still total rubbish. Next is Fire Lord, which is a pretty interesting action adventure game. It's chaotic, but once you understand what's going on, it's pretty cool. Next is Gribbly's Day Out, which is more Gremlin graphics weirdness. As Gribbly, you gotta rescue your friends in these elaborate death trap top levels. It's okay, I guess. Next is Hawkeye, which is maximum thalamus goodness. A side-scrolling action adventure game with great graphics and another excellent Jerome Tell music score. Next is Heartland, which is one of the games I never actually got to play back in the day. So I haven't really got to grips with it yet, but it seems pretty cool. Next is Herobotics, which is another budget title from Houston. It's average at best. Uh, I would just skip it. How I Encounter. This is a very unique game that is hard to explain in one sentence. Unfortunately, the same control issues that marred it in the 1980s are still here. Next is Hunter's Moon, which is a great shoot 'em up from Thalamus and features a classic Martin Walker soundtrack to boot. Next is Hysteria, a side scrolling action game with cool graphics and great music. I managed to finish this back in the day, but now I just suck at it. Next is IO, a great hard as nails scrolling space shoot 'em up. 
excellent graphics and atmosphere, but the learning curve is really steep. Next, Impossible Mission, which is one of my favorite games on the system and came out in 1984. Please check out my second episode of Car Coffee and 3 Reviews for a complete overview of this game. Next is Impossible Mission 2, which is a worthy sequel to the classic game. It adds a lot of extra elements to the mix and is worth a playthrough. Up next is Jumpman, a pretty good first generation C64 platform game with simplistic graphics but great gameplay. I only wish they had included this superior sequel, Jumpman Jr. instead. Next is Mega Apocalypse, which is a great shoot 'em up. Think of it as a bit of asteroids and pang mashed together in a shoot 'em up sandwich. Excellent Rob Hubbard music as well. Mission AD is a side scrolling action adventure game where you gotta assassinate a whole bunch of dudes. Good graphics, but it gets tedious real quickly. Next is Wanted Monty Mole, which is the original Monty game and is a good puzzle action adventure game. The sequel is vastly superior. And next is Monty on the Run, which is the vastly superior sequel that is challenging but still fair and has an excellent Rob Hubbard soundtrack, which I recently featured in a Wide for Sound episode. Next is Nebulous, which is a cool platform game by Houston with excellent graphics and sound and goes by the absolutely awful name of Tower Toppler in North America in case you thought it looked familiar. Next is Netherworld, which is a weird I'm trying to escape hell by collecting a bunch of stuff and shooting things. <laughs> Actually it's quite a good game with nice graphics and sound. Next is Nobby the Oddvark, a tough as hell platform game by Thalamus that gives its best shot at trying to be an NES game and does a pretty good job at it. Next is Nodes of Yesod, strange but fun game that is part platform action and adventure game all rolled into one and it plays really well. Next is Paradroid, which is another Andrew Braybrook game that I could never get into as a kid. I'm still kind of conflicted if I like this game or not. Next is Pit Stop, which is classic C64 racing at its best. Bold graphics and great two player action. Check out my top 10 C64 races video for more info on that game. Next up is Ranorama, which is another bizarre game, which is basically a gauntlet type game with you as a frog. I kind of enjoyed playing this way more now than I did back in the day. Next is Robin of the Wood, which is a very fast paced action adventure game with really nice graphics, but it's tough as hell be prepared to die a lot. Next is Rubicon, which is a pretty amazing game that was released in 1991 as a side-scrolling action game in the Hawkeye vein with excellent Jerome Tell music as always. Next is Skate Crazy, which is a fun roller skating pick up the trash arcade action game that is still pretty fun to play even now. School Days was one of those spectrum ports that I shunned to high heaven back in the 1980s, but finally playing it now, it's actually pretty good, although the spectrum graphics are a hard pill to swallow. Next is Snare, which is probably my least favorite Thalamus game and so it's really hard to say much about it besides it requires a massive learning curve. Next is Speedball by the Bitmap Brothers, an excellent futuristic sports game that is basically a video game adaptation of the 1970s rollerball movie. Great game on all levels. Speedball 2 is even better than the first with much more flowing gameplay and great graphics and music. Another excellent Bitmap Brothers game. Spin Dizzy is a game that always used to remind me of the arcade game Mob Madness except with a spinning top. Next is Star Wars, which is a fun little action adventure game with nice graphics and an excellent excellent Rob Hubbard soundtrack. Next is Steel, which is a pretty cool unknown gem of a budget game that has some really good graphics and is really pretty interesting overall. Next is Street Sports Baseball by Epix, which is a cool baseball game that is fun to play and the presentation is really top notch. Great two player game. Summer Games 2 by Epix is another one of their sports multi-event games that is still fun to play. Great graphics and presentation as usual. Next is Super Cycle, which is a brilliant racing game. It's another game on my top 10 races list. Next is the Temple of Apshai Trilogy, which is a pretty good dungeon crawling RPG series. You're definitely going to have to check out the C64 Mini website for the full instructions to the sucker. Next is Ark of Yesod, which is a sequel to the very cool nodes of Yesod we saw earlier. It's mostly the same game with a new setting. Next is Thing on a Spring, which is a fun but difficult platform action game made by those mental folks at Kremlin Graphics. Next is Thing Bounces Back, which is a sequel that I was really disappointed with back in the day. It's still kind of annoying to play. Next is Trailblazer, which is the last of the footballs and space genre that Kremlin created. It's fast and difficult, and be prepared to cry a lot. Next is Uchimada, which is a bit of a forgotten gem of a versus fighting game that uses judo as its discipline. Interesting strategic gameplay. Next is Iridium, which is the last of the Andrew Braybrook games on this list, and is by far my favorite. Cool shoot em up action with great sound. Next is Who Dares Wins 2, which is a very cool running gun game in the same vein as Capcom's Commando. I played this a hell of a lot back in the day. Next is Winter Games, which is Epic's third multi event sports game on this list, and this is probably my favorite one out of all of them. Tons of cool winter sports events and great Epic's production values. Next is World Games, which is Epic's last entry year and another multi event sport game based on off kilted sports from around the world. This is an excellent game. And finally, we got Zyanaps, which is last but not least game on the list and came out in 1987. 
and is an absolutely awesome scrolling shoot em up game from Houston. Yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of games, right? Anyway, so what are my overall opinions on this system? I think it is freaking awesome. I'm not gonna lie, I love it. I think it's, I love the design, I love the look of it. I can't wait until the major firmware update comes out where I can play all the games I want to play, anything I want to. I think it's really accessible to newbies and as a veteran you don't have to shun this. This is not going to be replacing your Commodore 64, your real version. I've still got that, mine is set up, I play it all the time, can't replace those good old tape games. <laughs> so this is just an extension of it, that's what you can think of it as, an easier way to access your games quickly and easily. I really, really like the system. Just remember they got the C64 Mini website, you got forums in there, help, guides to everything, guides to all the games, more information about the games, firmware updates, etc, etc, so check that out. Their Facebook page is also really good. It's up to date all the time, lots of content on there, check that out also. Well worth your time if you like the system. And thanks for joining me, BassHB at 64K. I'm gonna go play some Armalite now. If you could like and subscribe, they'll be greatly appreciated. Thanks again for joining me on my first product review, and I'll see you next time. Cut to credits.